Adventure. Tonight we tell you the story of Terror at Twin Peaks by Ron Evans. My name is Tom Peterson, and I own a small hotel in a small town on the fringe of the Cagliari Desert. I wasn't always an hotel owner, though. Most of my life has been spent out in the endless waste of sand. I look for diamonds, gold, or anything else that could make money. Yes, I did make money, which is how I came to own this hotel. It ain't such a pretty story that I'm going to tell you, but I'm sure there must be a moral in it somewhere. It was this time last year that a young couple walked into the hotel lounge. She was a sweet kid, but a fiancé... Can't say I liked his arrogant manner. Tell me, are you the owner of this place? I am. Can I help you? Oh, you certainly can. We're looking for a man called Sam Coker. He's a prospector, I'm told. He was recommended to us as a man who knows this part of the Kalahari better than anybody else. Yeah, next to me, that is. Yes, Sam's an old friend and rival of mine. A rival? <laughs> we were both prospectors until a few years ago. Nowadays, Sam makes a living by taking out tourists, photographers, and film crews into the desert as a guide, sort of. Yeah, that's what we want him for. Now, would you kindly tell me where we can find him? He's nearly five, so I think if you stay here for a few minutes, he'll be in. Most afternoons he comes here. We have a sundowner or two and play cards. <laughs> we play poker, and I usually win. Poor Sam's a lousy player. You know, he struck it rich once, then gambled most of it away. So I came to own this place. He lost that much money? Yeah, that's right, lady. If he hadn't lost it on poker, he'd have found some other way of getting rid of it. He's that tight. He can't hold on to a cent. Well, he's not as old as you, I hope. No. I can give him 20 years. I'd say he's in his uh, late 40s. Strong as an ox, though. For sure, he's the man you need if you're planning a trip out into the desert. Here, can I uh, offer you a drink while you're waiting? Oh, yes, please. Just a lemonade for me. I'll have a brandy and ginger ale. Good. Take a seat here now. I'll get a waiter to bring it in. I'm beginning to feel a bit apprehensive about all this, Alan. Don't. I'm sure we're not in a wild goose chase. Your father knew what he was doing. So do I, but it was all so long ago. Oh, well. I suppose I'd better leave it all to you. This is that I... I feel like some kind of crook. Coming here and giving a false surname. And I've explained the reason to you. Some of these people here may recognize it and get nosy. We can't afford that to happen. Shh. Now, here's the fellow coming back with the drinks. Reed is busy on the veranda, so I brought them myself to save time. Thanks. Oh, I need this. Yes, yes it's been a scorcher today. Yeah. Ah, it's Sam now. Sam? Hey, Sam. There's some folks here who want to meet you. Yes? What is it? My name's Alan Radcliffe, and this is my fiance, Jill Harrison. Glad to do. Something I can do for you? Well, if you'll excuse me, uh, see you in the bar later, Sam. Well, you were recommended to us as the best man to take on a trip into the Kalahari. I'll agree on that. What are you planning to do there? Take pictures? No. Just a trip, that's all. There's not much to see if it's sights you're looking for. We'd like to go just the same, Mr. Coker. I'd like to know the real reason. We're we willing to pay a thousand rond for a week of your time. Oh, that kind of money sounds like music in my ears. But what's the catch? There isn't one. One thousand for a week's trip into the desert. Oh, nobody pays that kind of money for nothing. Perhaps not. But they'll pay it if they don't want to be bothered by questions. Oh, I'll come to the point. Is what you are planning legal? Strictly. Still sounds damn fishy to me. A thousand for a week's aimless tramping around the desert. It's not aimless. We'll be heading southwest from here. I'll give you the exact route after we leave. Mm, southwest? Hmm. That's the roughest part. Sandstorms are frequent. Quicksand and Consider all. the fee, then consider the risk. Okay. We can make a start early tomorrow. You already equipped? No. You'd better tell us what we need. Oh, I'll get Van Vec to open his shop for us. 
But we'll have to travel light. We can go so far in my truck. After that, it's purely bootwork. Let's drink to the trip, shall we? Glad to. If I can just get hold of that blasted waiter. Let me go on with my story. They drove all the next morning. Apart from a plentiful supply of water and food, each of the men carried a rifle with a telescopic sight. It was plain to Jill that there was a tension of mutual dislike between the two men. Dallin's abrupt manner did little to easy. Shortly after noon, they ran into an area where the sand formed high dunes, like a barrier forbidding them to go further. Sam Coker pulled up and switched off the engine. I'm afraid this is the end of the ride. We'll have to walk from here. That's all right, Mr. Coker. I just wish it wasn't so hot. Yeah. Wish I could say you'd get used to it, miss, but I can't. These packs feel heavy. Well, they'll get lighter as we eat and drink along the way. Well, I suppose you'd better tell me your destination now, Mr. Radcliffe. When I'm ready. In the meantime, we continue in a southwesterly direction. It'd be a help if you told me now. Not yet. But come on, man, we're wasting time. Who's doing the guiding? You or me? Look, I've an excellent compass here, Coker. I'll only be needing your guidance when we're nearer our objective. Okay, if that's the way it's to be. I'll relax and enjoy the scenery. All I want you to do at present is to warn us of dangers like quicksand. Came the evening, the moments between the sun going down and darkness. They stopped while they drank and ate. The gap of antagonism grew wider. It'd be better if we sleep a few hours and carry on until sunrise. Then we can get a long sleep in the shade of one of those south-facing dunes. Hmm, sounds like a good idea. We'll do that. But first, I must insist on knowing where we're going. We had that out earlier. You'll be told when you need to know. Then I refuse to go any further. You'll do as I order you to. Let go of the front of my shirt, son. I'm paying you. No, no please. You've been asking for that all day. Mr. Coker, where are you going? Back to town. Can't work under these conditions. No, no don't leave us here. Alan, stop him. Talk to him. All right. It'll make you happy. I'm just telling you the destination. Nothing more. Do you understand? That's all I want. Okay. Have you ever heard of a large area of desert which is dead flat and where there are only two things that can be seen? Two pointed columns of rock standing out of it. Like two pencils standing up in the middle of a dinner plate. Yes, I know it. The old timers call it Twin Peaks. Nobody ever goes near that place nowadays. Well, that's where we're going. <laughs> You're crazy. Star craving crazy. Why? What's wrong with it? Well, if the snakes don't get you, the quicksand will. Maybe Mr. Coker's right. Let's forget the whole thing. Oh, will we? We're going right up to those peaks and we're coming back. Alive. I'm warning you both. If we go there, it's unlikely we'll survive. That's the most treacherous tract of land in the whole Kalahari. Dozens have died there, yes, and they all laughed like you, Mr. Radcliffe. Why are you so scared? I thought you were an expert, the best there is. I am, that's why I'm telling you all this. What you paid me to do. I don't like it, Alan. I've a premonition of something too terrible. Oh, rubbish. When could we be there? Tomorrow evening, if we take a rest in the morning. But tomorrow's the 10th. We must be there by then. Oh, meeting someone? We want to be there by midday. It's imperative. I think you'd better tell me the whole story. No, we've told you enough. If we don't rest in the morning, could we get there in time? Just about, but you'll be more dead than alive. We must be there by tomorrow at noon. Oh, very well, then. We'd better make a start now. Get your packs. Already weary from the day's journey, they struggle through the night, guided by Alan's compass and Sam's experience. At the yellow morning dawn, they topped a dune and looked out across a flat and featureless plain. Far away on the distant horizon could be seen the sharp tips of Twin Peaks, still some ten miles away. Alan pointed, shaking with excitement. Look! Look! There they are! We've made it, Alan! Oh, not yet, you haven't. There's still a few miles to go. You'll be there long before noon. From here to there, it'll be like going through a minefield. There are quicksands that'll slip you down so fast you'll barely have time to scream. And in between those peaks, there are more snakes to the square meter than in Durban Snake Park. Just lead on, will you? 
Everything will be all right, you'll see. I wished I knew what all this was about. Get us safely to those peaks, Coker, and you'll soon know. The two peaks stood 30 feet high, and by 11 the small group had reached the shade from them on the far side. To Sam Coker's surprise, the young couple sat down and rested. He was about to join them when... Please go and sit over there, Coker. My fiancé and I want to talk privately. Oh, sure. I don't want to intrude. He's done his job now. We don't even need him. It's just a matter of retracing our own footprints back. You can hardly dismiss him now we've arrived. It's not what I had in mind. Oh, why is the time dragging so? It's half an hour to go. Surely we can work it out without having to, to wait any longer. Exactly noon, darling. Be patient. Sam Coker was glaring. He felt very uneasy. He sat with his rifle cradled across his lap, thinking the best way to play it from here would be to go along meekly and see what happens. He saw Ratcliffe glance at his watch, stand up, and help Jill to her feet. Coker, you can come and help us. He walked slowly towards them. Jill paced out to the tip of the shadow of the eastern peak and dug her foot into the ground. Come on, this is the place. Fine. So let's start digging. Digging? What for? Put down your rifle and dig. You'll soon see. I'm not being paid to dig. Especially with my bare hands. It'll be well worth your while when you see what's down there. The three of them scrabbled at the loose sand. Slowly the hole widened and deepened. Alan's hand shook as he shouted. It's near. I can feel it. Dig. Dig down here. Their efforts increased until a few minutes later a lightweight metal chest was dragged out of the hole. A large padlock held it closed. At that moment, Jill and Sam sat back on their haunches to regain their breath. And Alan dived at and grabbed Sam's rifle. He pointed it up at them. Alan! Stand back! Stand back, both of you! Stop playing games, Alan. Put that gun down. It's loaded. And the theft is off. What are you trying to prove? What's in that chest was mine. And mine only. I've worked hard for that these past two years. I, I don't understand. Do you think that I've buttered up and humoured a sniveling, spoilt wretch like you for nothing? I can manage to get this chest back to the truck. I don't need either of you anymore. So, so you're going to kill us, eh? Yes. Yes, you can occupy that hole together. Very cosy and romantic, don't you think? I think you've gone mad, Alan. With the speed of a striking mumba, Sam kicked sand up into Alan's face, then flung himself forward to grapple with him. Oh, God. Yeah. Get the other rifle! Jill ran off to where Alan had left his gun. Meanwhile, the two men were knocked in a life and death struggle. Suddenly, Sam tripped over the trunk. Got you! Go! If you shoot him, I'll fire, Alan. Drop would, your gun. Would you shoot me, Jill? I don't think you have the courage. Come here and give me that rifle. No. I mean it, Alan. Go on. Go on, kill me. I don't think you even know how to use that thing. Give it to me. Alan, what are you doing? Emptying it. And for trying to shoot me, I'm going to make you suffer. Both of you. Here, do you see this water? No, Alan. I'm going to leave you here and take the water with me. You'll never make it back to town, that's for sure. Neither will you. I shall. All I have to do is retrace our route to the truck. Well, I can't say I'll wish you luck. <sighs> this is heavier than I thought. But I'll make it. He moved off, the chest supported by one hand on his shoulder. In his other hand, he carried the loaded rifle. A man can find a lot of extra strength when he's carrying a fortune. With tears rolling down her cheeks, Jill watched him go carefully following their footprints back to the distant dunes. She stooped beside Sam. He was just recovering. Jill quickly told him what had happened. Uh, uh, that's his mistake. We can get out alive. In fact, we can easily make it back to the truck before him. Uh, <laughs> as for the rifle, there's a spare box of ammunition in my pack. We must go after him. Relax, there's plenty of time. Now... I want to know what all this is about first. Yes. Yes, you're entitled to that. You see, 
About ten years ago, my father went bankrupt when his partner absconded overseas with a lot of money. For many years, he'd collected a vast number of gold coins, many of them very old and all of great value. He'd always told me that they were our security for the future, realizing his collection would be sequestrated when the crash came. He disappeared with the entire fortune in coins, promising he'd come back in a few years and face the music. He didn't. What happened to him was a mystery. Maybe he was robbed and murdered. That's what I think. Hold on. On my 21st birthday, I received a third letter from my father's lawyer. It explained what he was about to do. It was to bury the collection in the sand at Twin Peaks at the place where the shadow of the eastern peak touches at noon on the 10th of April every year. Hmm. Clever of him. He knew the desert well when he was a young man. But he must have succeeded in burying the collection and then got lost. If, if only I knew the truth. I, uh, I can't say I knew or met anybody with the name of Harrison. Oh, that isn't my real name. It's Bailey. My father was Charles Bailey. Ah, yes. I knew Charlie Bailey. <laughs> Last time I saw him was some ten years back. You did? Oh, after he came out of the desert? No, I'm sorry. He must have gone into the Kalahari and died there. Well, now you know about as much as I do. Does uh, anybody else know you're here? What you've come for? Not a soul. Alan insisted everything be done in secret. I can see why now. So he could kill you and have the gold collection for himself, eh? <laughs> How could I have let myself be taken in like that? I must have been blind. Well, it said that love is blind. You were probably lonely, too. I was, Mr. Cooker. What shall we do now? Go after him. He won't get very far without having to stop for a rest. And that's when we get him. They followed Alan Radcliffe for two hours before catching sight of him. He had a lot more stamina than Sam had given him credit for. Chest was now off his shoulder and he was dragging it behind him. In his haste to get away, he hadn't yet opened it. From the top of a high dune, Sam and Jill watched him stagger on. Look, he stopped. He's looking at the chest, at the lock. <laughs> he wants to see his loot. Huh. Looks like he's going to shoot off the lock. Now listen, this could be our chance. I'll circle around to the other side of him. When I wave, call and walk down towards him. It'll distract him for just a few moments. Moments I need. You got that? Won't he try and shoot me? I won't give him time. Just do as I tell you and you'll be all right. While well, Sam moved cautiously to his other side, Alan unslung his rifle and shot off the lock. His hand shook with anticipation as he pulled out the meat. His expression changed to one of horror when he looked down at the contents. There was no gold, merely a dozen heavy stones and a skeleton. With wild eyes, he looked around him, then turned back to the contents. The gold coins. Where are they? All of this for? For nothing. Alan! Alan! Alan looked up to see Jill walking towards him. To her horror, she saw Sam make no move to attack Alan. Instead, he sat relaxed, cradling his rifle. Alan quickly snapped up his gun, pointed it, and took aim. Sam merely smiled. And armed with no cover, Jill stopped in her tracks. Mr. Coco, do something. Realizing Sam was behind him, Alan turned and ready to fire. <laughs> Sam fired first. His bullet drilled a neat hole in Alan's forehead. The body fell across the chest and slowly, grotesquely, flopped onto the sand. So petrified with fear, Jill watched as Sam slowly and casually walked up to the body. Using the muzzle of his rifle, he flipped open the chest. <laughs> Come and take a look at the treasure, Miss Bailey. She snapped out of a state of shock and walked towards him. The steps were slow and purposeful. He could easily have shot me, yet you did nothing. You said... Never mind what I said. I had my reasons. And why did you have to kill him? You could have grabbed him from behind. There was plenty of time. There's your answer. Look in the chest. Stones? And... I wanted Radcliffe to shoot you before I shot him. You spoiled it by shouting to me. I don't understand. Why? That was your father in the chest. Now you found him. No. No. You're lying. 
lying. I met your father when he was burying this chest at Twin Peaks. He tried to drive me away with his gun, but I was the better shot. I managed to get the old back to town without anybody seeing me. Then I traveled up and down the country and converted it all into hard currency. <laughs> Didn't do me much good, though. I lost half of it at poker to old Tom Peterson. The rest are frittered away and I living and every drinking. Sorry, girl, but that's the way it is. It's awful. You murdered my father. Like I said. And now I'll have to murder you. Desperation gave due resource in a sudden burst of energy. With a quick movement, she kicked back the lid of the chest, which was between her and Coca. She ran away, instinctively weaving, expecting any moment to hear another shot and a bullet find its mark in her back. However, Sam laughed and gave chess. <laughs> run, girl, run. I enjoy hunting. <laughs> she ran for her life. Sam not far behind, laughing like a child at play. Jill ran blindly, not daring to look back. Sam circled around her, then climbed to the top of high dune. From his perch, she made a beautiful target. He unslung his rifle and took very careful aim. Hearing the shot, Jill stopped still in the tracks and looked back, just in time to see Sam clutching at his leg. And almost in slow motion, he fell and rolled amid a cloud of bowdery dust to the foot of the dune. With fascinated horror, she saw him try to stand up. Help! Help me! I'm in the quicksand! Already the sand was up to his waist. Sam's arms flayed the dry air as though looking for support. His mouth opened and closed. And it was all over. Jill sank to her knees and her shoulders shook with convulsive sobbing. A few moments later, a shadow fell across her. And she looked up with a start. What are you doing here? I... I stooped beside her and put a comforting arm over her shoulder. For a minute, she cringed away. Then she relaxed. I saw him chasing you. I didn't intend him to go into the quicksand, though. You better tell me what happened. He was going to kill me. How do you come to be out here in the desert? Well, I felt just a wee bit curious about what you and you young man were up to. You people around here are like that. Naturally nosy. It seems like I did the right thing, eh? investigation by the police, but it, it all ended well. She was a good kid, was Jill. By rights, my hotel should have been hers, but she told me to carry on. But as I'll soon be passing on, I'll be leaving it to her in my will. She's engaged to be married to a handsome young man who'll make her a fine husband. And I know she's going to be a wonderful daughter-in-law. <laughs> Adventure is produced by Anne Freed and directed by Henry Diffenthal. Mm -hmm.